Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see everybody here. I want to welcome you back to the State Department. Many of you have been here several times this year, and it's nice to see you here again. This administration sees the Western Hemisphere, Canada, Latin America, and the Caribbean as a strategic priority for the United States. After all, we are the Caribbean's largest trading partner. Millions of Americans visit and study in the Caribbean. We share many interests and see incredible opportunity. This year, we celebrate 10 years of our partnership under the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative. However, the United States has had deep ties to the Caribbean since our founding. George Washington's only trip outside of the continental United States was to Barbados. Alexander Hamilton was born in Nevis and studied accounting in St. Croix. Thomas Jefferson couldn't have negotiated the Louisiana Purchase without the freedom fighters in Haiti who forced France to reconsider its global ambitions. But for a long time, many perceived that the United States had neglected our relationships in the Caribbean to our great detriment. No more. The Trump administration is changing that. It has put a new focus on closer ties with the region due to our shared interest and the crisis in Venezuela, which require greater cooperation, not less. This is why President Trump hosted leaders of the Bahamas, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, and St. Lucia at Mar-a-Lago in March. And Deputy Secretary Sullivan launched the new U.S.-Caribbean Resilience Partnership in Miami with 18 Caribbean governments in April. We are further building on those efforts to draw on all the tools of the U.S. government to expand and enhance our relationship in the Caribbean. Earlier this month, the Department of Energy hosted an energy resilience workshop for the Caribbean in Puerto Rico. In June, the Department of Commerce will host the U.S.-Caribbean Business Conference, coupled with USTR's Trade and Investment Council meeting with CARICOM, and a follow-on roundtable on correspondent banking issues. We recognize the importance of the Caribbean to the success of this hemisphere and believe that a region united in our shared values and shared interests will result in a more prosperous region. Key to this is the issue of our security. Our meeting today is an opportunity to chart the course of our partnership to address crime and security in the Caribbean and identify ways together to enhance efforts to build on our results. To demonstrate our commitment to this partnership, I am pleased that many U.S. agencies have joined today's dialogue, including the Department of Defense, the United States Southern Command, the United States Northern Command, Department of Homeland Security, the Coast Guard, Department of Justice, the Federal Aviation Administration, and the U.S. Agency for International Development. These actions show the Trump administration's dedication to our region and represent our coordinated investment and bipartisan support of the U.S. Congress with the U.S. Caribbean 2020 strategy to improve our collective security. Under the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative, the United States has allocated close to $600 million over the last 10 years to support our joint efforts on combating illicit trafficking networks, increasing public safety and security, strengthening rule of law, and reducing youth crime and violence. The theme for today's dialogue is a strategic, integrated, smarter, technological approach to security. And we have an opportunity to recognize our success and continue challenges under CBSI and discuss ways to take our cooperation to the next level and advance our shared goals. Our joint efforts have resulted in many wins, including extraditing 18 lottery scammers from Jamaica who prey on the elderly so they can face justice for their crimes. So far in 2019, our drug interdiction efforts in the Bahamas and Turks and Caicos have already exceeded by 150 percent the amount of illegal drugs seized in all of FY 2018. In the Dominican Republic, CBSI programs have yielded a 250 percent increase in cocaine interdictions from 2017 to 2018. In April 2019, Trinidad and Tobago passed comprehensive civil asset recovery legislation drafted with support from CBSI's Caribbean Senior Financial Crimes Advisor, making it the sixth country in the region to pass such legislation with CBSI assistance. USAID has also worked with at-risk youth in over 400 communities, greatly improving their employment prospects. 
I commend CARICOM for adopting its first ever regional counterterrorism strategy last year. More countries in the Western Hemisphere should follow your leadership on this. These successes have occurred because leaders in government, in the private sector, and civil society took ownership of the challenges and showed willingness to jointly address them. In addition to achieving clear, measurable results under CBSI, the Caribbean continues to face increasing threats from terrorism, transnational criminal organizations, illicit trafficking, and illegal migration. Violent extremists from the region have chosen to join ISIS. Trinidad and Tobago is grappling with the highest per capita recruitment of foreign terrorist fighters in the Western Hemisphere. The government of Trinidad and Tobago has recently estimated that the number, a number between 130 and 160 have left to join. We continue to deepen our security cooperation to tackle these challenges. On illicit trafficking, whether of drugs, firearms, or people, it ruins lives and destabilizes societies. Transnational criminal organizations exploit permissive environments to conduct their illegal activities, and their actions steal sovereign resources, sap economic vitality, and threaten our citizens. Better coordination of law enforcement efforts, stronger democratic institutions and judicial systems, and a vibrant civil society are essential to tackling these challenges. Further to this, we urge all of our Caribbean partners to join the United States and ratify the San Jose Treaty, an agreement that will give our maritime authorities an important law enforcement tool to secure our shared economy and the safety of our citizens. We must also work together to manage the destabilizing crisis of Venezuela and the thousands of Venezuelan migrants who have sought refuge in your countries. In some of your countries, the numbers now reach as high as 10% of the populations. We want to support you as you respond to the increasing migration flows and results that impact your communities. We will be sending the United States Navy ship Comfort to the Caribbean to offer this assistance. We cannot remain silent on the political, economic, and humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. It will only continue to worsen as people lack food, water, medicine, and electricity. As the narco-criminal groups continue funneling drugs and crime north into the Caribbean, this instability will spread further into the region. We hope additional countries will join the critical mass in the Western Hemisphere who have chosen to support the Venezuelan people and the leader they have chosen via their constitution, interim president Juan Guaido. If we oppose foreign intervention, we must cry foul when foreign powers like Russia and Cuba stake a claim by overtly landing military forces on South American territory. The United States and all freedom-loving countries should be deeply concerned to the point of action, closer cooperation, and support to our neighbors in need. Moreover, we need to be prepared to expand our cooperation to counter future threats. I've spoken in the past about the transformational nature of 5G technology, the need to fully factor security into procurement decisions, and cybersecurity challenges. As countries in the region make decisions about how to build out their 5G infrastructure, I urge all of you to look at best practices and incorporate security into these critical networks from the start. For instance, aging infrastructure, ports, highways, and telecommunication systems need upgrades. As the Caribbean considers options for addressing these issues, look to the United States, our technical expertise, transparency, and businesses and U.S. companies as resources and partners. As you know, China has more equity capital invested in the Caribbean on a per capita basis than it does in the rest of Latin America. If Chinese companies operate on a level playing field in ways where they play by the rules, this investment could greatly benefit your countries. However, far too often China has departed from international best practices, and when it does, its opaque methods have enabled corruption, eroded good governance, and stolen country sovereignty and national resources. In the Western Hemisphere, all countries should require that infrastructure development projects feature a transparent procurement process, uphold environmental and social safeguards, and foster inclusive growth in line with the standards of international financial institutions. In the Caribbean, there are at least nine so-called Confucius Institutes 
spreading Chinese Communist Party propaganda throughout the region. This is incompatible with the region's deep democratic legacy and respect for free expression. Russia's presence in the Caribbean is also now stronger than at any time since the end of the Cold War. New embassies, military cooperation agreements, Russian spy ships being spotted by the U.S. Navy, and Caribbean ports and mines being open to Russian companies create strategic vulnerabilities. I realize that you all know this and are aware of the implications. However, I want to underscore that the United States is your neighbor. We share your values and cultures, and we have much at stake together at shaping the future of the region through efforts like CBSI. Our investment decisions today will have a generational impact on our citizens in the future. In conclusion, the United States under the Trump administration is engaging more in the Caribbean. We see a lot of positive movement from all of your countries, and we are joining with the rest of the hemisphere to create an engine for economic vitality, innovation, and growth. A secure environment is essential to achieving these goals. So we have, we have more work to do together in the Caribbean. In just over a week, Caribbean Heritage Month in the United States will begin. Here at the State Department, we are also kicking off what we are calling the Year of the Caribbean to highlight our growing engagement in the Caribbean under the 2020 strategy. We very much look forward to the results of today's CBSI dialogue and more importantly, to actions and results to improve the lives of our citizens. Thank you all for being here and for your country's commitment to the CBSI, the U.S.-Caribbean 2020 strategy, and the U.S.-Caribbean Resilience Partnership. Let's consider how we can make more of a difference in the days ahead through our efforts together. Thank you.